everybody, welcome to Transformation Tuesday Bible Study. Today we are doing Miracles versus Magic Part 3. And from Part 3 to Part 4 and Part 5, which we will go over the next few weeks, we will be talking about the miracles of Jesus Christ. But before we begin, I'd like us to pray. By the name of Jesus, I pray that everybody comes to understand these miracles that Jesus Christ performed. And that some of them, or any of them, may have these same powers that Jesus had to perform miracles which we know are to build up the body of Christ, edify, expand the body of Christ, expand your kingdom, Lord. So fill them with that wisdom and that understanding, that discernment, that if they do have these powers to perform miracles, whether that's healing or deliverance, Lord, that they use it for your glory and your kingdom only, Lord. In the name of Jesus, amen. We'll be using the New King James Version of the Bible, but you can use any acceptable version. Let's begin. Let's open up our Bibles to Matthew chapter 8, verses 28 through 34. That's Matthew chapter 8, verses 28 through 34. When he had come to the other side, to the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two demon-possessed men, coming out of the tombs exceedingly fierce, so that no one could pass that way. And suddenly they cried out, saying, What have we to do with you, Jesus, you Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Now a good way off from them, there was a herd of many swine feeding. So the demons begged him, saying, If you cast us out, permit us to go away into the herd of swine. And he said to them, Go. So when they had come out, they went into the herd of swine. And suddenly the whole herd of swine ran violently down the steep place into the sea and perished in the water. Then those who kept them fled, and they went away into the city and told everything, including what happened to the demon-possessed men. And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they begged him to depart from their region. So here Jesus met two men who were demon-possessed. They were fierce, they were in front of this tomb, and nobody went near that tomb because of how scary they were. And of course, the demons noticed who Jesus was, and they asked him if he was there to torment them. And that's what you guys have to understand. This is also why it's so important for us to be more like Jesus Christ and to focus on our own salvation in fear and trembling. Because if we do that, then demons won't be attracted to us. They want. They wouldn't even want to come near us because they know that we're holy. They know that we're obedient. They know that we're not going to slip into their traps. All right? So what they did was they said, okay, if you're going to cast us out, cast us out into those pigs. And that's exactly what he did. When he casted them out into those pigs, they went over the cliff and into the water and drowned. Okay? So also, when you're casting out demons, they have to go somewhere or else they'll go somewhere. They're going to uh, somebody else. So you have to ask the Lord to get rid of them, take him to his throne for complete and final judgment. Just get rid of them, period, if that's what you're doing. And not only that, when, they, when the pig herders saw this, they were so surprised. They went and told the whole city, you know, what happened. And then the whole city came and met Jesus, but they told him to leave because they were so scared. And that's what you guys have to understand. Some people are not going to accept your testimony. They're not going to accept, even though they saw a miracle right in front of them, somebody get healed, somebody get delivered. They're not, they're still not going to believe and you can't force them. You have to just let them go. Just like Jesus did here. He let them go. You know, he went away. And even though if you look at uh, the book of Luke, chapter 8, I believe is 38 through 39, you'll see that one of the men wanted him to stay. One of the men who got delivered wanted him to stay, but Jesus still left anyway and told him to go and t go home and tell others all the wonderful things that God did for him. And that's exactly what he did. So the testimony still went forth to other people, even though there's still some other people who were afraid. And you're going to encounter that. This is why I keep saying there's no point in forcing it on people because God respects people's free will. They have a free will. They have a right to be afraid. They have a right to say no, unfortunately, to Jesus or to believing. But the point is, is that that seed was planted. Most people know what happened. So you never know, even though they were scared at that moment, 
they may end up believing later because they did receive that testimony, but they didn't re believe right then and there. And so you have to understand that, that you cannot force this on anybody at all. Let's continue. So let's turn to Matthew chapter 9, verses 27 through 31. That's Matthew chapter 9, verses 27 through 31. When Jesus departed from there, two blind men followed him, crying out and saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. And when he had come into the house, the blind men came to him. And Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, let it be to you. And their eyes were opened. And Jesus sternly warned them, saying, See that no one knows it. But when they had departed, they spread the news about him in all that country. So these two blind men saw Jesus and they knew who he was. They knew that he was the son of David. And this was prophesied by Isaiah that, you know, that Jesus would be a descendant of David and that he would also be able to heal. All right. And so they knew that and they wanted to be able to see it again. And they asked for his mercy. And Jesus asked them, do you believe that I can do this? And they said, yes. And all he did was he touched their eyes and they were able to see again. And that all, that's all it took was one touch. There was no magic involved. The power that Jesus did that through was through the power of the Holy Spirit. Remember that the Holy Spirit comes from Jesus. It came from him when he ascended into heaven. So that was the power that he used, just like the power that he used before. He didn't use any demonic power in order to give him that healing. And that's another thing. If somebody has a gift of healing, and the Lord gives them that unction to heal you of whatever you're going through. Sometimes you don't even know what that thing is, that sickness that you have in your body, but God gave them that word of knowledge that, look, this person is sick or this person needs this healed. You have to have the faith and believe that that person can do it or else it's not going to happen. That's why it happened for these guys because they believed. They had the faith that he can do it. The same way you have to have the faith that somebody who has a spiritual gift of healing can do that. Okay? And then he told them not to tell anybody what just happened. Why? Because he was trying to keep his fame and him being the Messiah, um, you know, in control and not out of control. Because there were people who hated Jesus. There were people who knew that he was coming. There were people who tried to kill him when he was a baby. So he knew that. And that's another thing. Sometimes you cannot tell everybody your miracle, just like I said before. You can't give everybody your testimony and you have to really seek the Lord and get your discernment up. Get that to increase, all right? So be closer and closer to God through Jesus Christ. Pray a lot and he will give you that unction as to when you should give a te testimony and when you shouldn't, who you should give it to and who you should not give it to, you know? So you have to be very careful with these things. Perfect example is sometimes there's places of work where you cannot give that kind of testimony. It is what it is. Don't do it. You know, yeah, we're taught to be fearless, but we're also taught to be smart, just like Jesus tried to tell these people not to do that. But they went and did it anyway. They went and did it anyway. They disobeyed him. And I don't think that they did it maliciously. I think they were just so excited that they could now see and that Jesus did that. So they had good intentions, but they didn't listen to what he said. So we have to make sure that even when we do get healed or we get delivered, that we're very careful in how we present it. We're very careful of who we give that information to. And we're very careful as to when. And you can do all that through the power of the Holy Spirit and through asking the Lord for his guidance. You're going to have to ask him for his guidance as to when to give this information out. Let's continue. Let's continue on Matthew chapter 9 verses 32 through 34. That's Matthew chapter 9 verses 32 through 34. As they went out, behold, they brought to him a man, mute and demon possessed. And when the demon was cast out, the mute spoke and the multitudes marveled, saying it was never seen like this in Israel. But the Pharisees said he casts out demons by the ruler of demons. So here, a demon-possessed man who was mute was brought to Jesus, okay? 
and Jesus was able to heal him of that. He was able to deliver him from the demon that caused that because Jesus had that discernment that it was the demon causing the illness. Sometimes, like I talked about in my um, Divine Healing and Healthcare series, there's a demon that causes a sickness and sometimes it's just a random sickness, but here that's clearly what it was. And so the demon was cast out and the man was now able to speak, all right? And again, no magic was done. This was all done by the power of the Holy Spirit, but the Pharisees said that this was of Satan. That the reason why he was able to do this was because of power that he got from Satan. That is called blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. These people were legalists. Pharisees are legalists. They were followed the traditions of men, okay? And they were also lawyers in a way, but yes. They could not, they were spiritually blind. They could not understand the Bible from the power of the Holy Spirit. They believed in the resurrection, but they wanted everybody to follow these legal traditions, okay? And they did not believe in the power of the Holy Spirit, obviously. So they attributed this miracle to being something from the enemy himself. And there's plenty of people who do that today. There's plenty of cessationists who do that today or people who don't believe that people have that gift of healing would attribute that to the enemy. And that is a dangerous thing that you could do because it's a major sin to God and more judgment comes upon you. So you wanna make sure that you stay away from that and not attribute every single thing, every single miracle that somebody performs to Satan. Now, Again, there's some false healers out there that will, for instance, request money and everything. Here, Jesus didn't request any money or anything like that. That person was healed instantly. That person was able to talk, so there was evidence. And the Pharisees knew who Jesus was. But again, because they're legalistic, they didn't believe that that power was of God, but was of Satan. And so we have to watch out for people who do that today and understand that there's a difference between real, genuine healing. That person's not gonna ask for money, okay? Now, if you wanna give that person money just as a thank you, you know, that's a different story, but the person is not going to ask for money in order for you to be delivered or in order for you to be healed, okay? So we have to make sure that we understand the difference and not make the mistake that these Pharisees make Okay, and it keeps happening today. These people keep making this mistake. And this is also why the church has no power. This is why. Because people are so afraid of the gifts of the spirit. They're so afraid of things like healing or they've been scarred by people who are false healers. Okay, who are fake. And again, God said there will be fake ones. But there's, it's very important to understand the distinction so that you don't blaspheme the Holy Spirit. All right, let's continue. Let's continue Luke chapter 4, verses 38 through 39. That's Luke chapter 4, verses 38 through 39. Now he arose from the synagogue and entered Simon's house. But Simon's wife's mother was sick with the high fever and they made request of him concerning her. So he stood over her and rebuked the fever and it left her. And immediately she arose and served them. So here Jesus went to Peter's house and of course Peter's mother-in-law was sick and he and his wife requested help from Jesus and he touched her. He also rebuked the fever and the fever was gone. And what she did was she wanted to serve them immediately. So there's a few things here. The fact that once again, through the power of the Holy Spirit within him, he was able to heal her from that fever. He was able to rebuke whatever was causing that fever, rebuke it flat out through the power of the Holy Spirit. And because she was so grateful, she served him. When the Lord does something for us, whether that's healing, whether that's a miracle, whether that's a blessing, whether him showing us unmerited favor, we need to be grateful to him and go out and serve others in his name. That's gonna bring glory to him. That's gonna grow his kingdom. That is the point of these miracles, is to enable us to serve, give our testimony, build the kingdom of God. That's the point of it. And we should do exactly 
what Peter's mother-in-law did here. Let's continue. So let's continue on Luke chapter 5, verses 12 through 16. That's Luke chapter 5, verses 12 to 16. And it happened when he was in a certain city that, behold, a man who was full of leprosy saw Jesus. And he fell on his face and implored him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then he put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately the leprosy left him. And he charged him to tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing as a testimony to them, just as Moses commanded. However, the report went around concerning him all the more, and great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. So he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. So here Jesus met a man who had leprosy. And by the way, leprosy is a chronic infectious disease that thank God is now curable that causes skin lesions as well as nerve damage. And the Lord, and he saw that, he saw the Lord and he begged the Lord for healing. He knew who Jesus was. He knew that he could heal. He heard about him before. This is why testimonies are so important and also your time is important. Like I said before, and you're gonna see why later. And Jesus touched him and he was healed. And mind you, back then, according to Mosaic law, we, they were not to touch lepers. People who had leprosy were to be kept separate so that they don't infect others. They were thought of as unclean, but Jesus touched him and he was cleansed. You see, that's what the power, that's what the Holy Spirit power does when somebody has that gift of healing. This is why it's so important that people understand this is still active today. And again, thank God there is a cure for this now, but that doesn't mean that there's other rashes and other diseases that don't have cures that, you know, Jesus can heal through somebody else now. If that's how he wants to use it, if that's how God wants it to happen, that's how it's going to happen. Okay? And that's what happened here. He was able to heal the man. He was able to cleanse him with also his word. That's another thing. You can use God's word to heal. And he told him not to tell anybody, but to go to the priest and let the priest know and also to make an offering. That's another thing. Once God does anything for you, once any miracle happens, like I said before, you serve or you give to others. You make an offering. That's exactly what he asked this man to do. But of course, he has loose lips and he went and told everybody. And again, we have to think when the Lord tells us not to tell we should not do that because he has a reason for it again there were people who were after jesus the pharisees didn't like jesus the pharisees as we saw attributed his works to satan so of course if he the thing is jesus would always he would tell people when to say who to who to say it to who to tell and he specifically told this guy not to say anything, and he did. And of course, other people wanted to see Jesus. They wanted to hear Jesus. They wanted to be healed by him, okay? Many of them. And so of course, oftentimes, Jesus would have to retreat into the wilderness in order to pray because he was becoming well-known. And he did not want to be known like that for a reason. He was there on a mission. He knew that he was going to be the sacrifice and he had to achieve that mission, you know, and he didn't want people to kill him before it's time. There was a, an appointed time for that to happen. And he already knew that there was a lot of non-believers. He already knew that there was a lot of Pharisees who, who um, were legalists. Okay. And people were after him even since he was a baby. So we have to really heed the Lord's warnings. We have to heed his warnings and Ask him when we're going to give a testimony. Ask him who to give it to. Discern the right time and the wrong time to do things. Okay? Let's continue. So let's turn to Luke chapter 5, verses 17 through 21. That's Luke chapter 5, verses 17 through 21. Now it happened on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Then behold, man brought on a bed 
a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. And when they could not find out how they may, might bring him in, because of the crowd, they went up on the housetop and let him down with his bed through the tilling into the midst before Jesus. When he saw their faith, he said to him, Man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can, who can forgive sins but God alone? And let's continue on Luke chapter 5 verses 22 through 26. That's Luke chapter 5 verses 22 through 26. But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said to them, Why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say your sins are forgiven you or to say rise up and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately he rose up before them, took up what he had been lying on, and departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed, and they glorified God, and were filled with fear, saying, We have seen strange things today. So here a paralyzed man was brought to Jesus by some men, and he saw their faith, and he forgave the man of his sins. Now, these people saw that this guy is paralyzed and they knew that, you know, Jesus was a healer and everything. But what Jesus saw was that this guy needed to be forgiven of his sins. That's a message to some people. Sometimes the sins that you're committing can manifest into actual sickness. And that's pretty much the case here. So of course the Pharisees saw this and they accused Jesus of blaspheming. And Jesus perceived that this is what they were doing, that they were accusing him of this because he is not God. To them, they were saying that he's not God and only God can forgive sins. But Jesus is actually God in the flesh. Okay? Jesus is God in the flesh. And they kept doing this. As you can see, this is what they did before. They kept blaspheming the Holy Spirit. They kept blaspheming Jesus in general and not attributing any of his works to God. And to the Holy Spirit that was working within Jesus. And so, of course, then Jesus said, which one would you rather me do? Would you rather me tell him to get up? So Jesus did both. He forgave him of his sins and he told him to get up, lift up his bed and go. And of course, the paralyzed man got up and everything was able to walk, took his bed with him and left. And all the men who were there were so amazed by this, but they also had a healthy fear of God now. A healthy fear of Jesus. Okay? So... That's what this shows. This shows a couple of things. You know, you can't doubt the Lord and how the Lord works through people. You can't doubt the power of the Holy Spirit. And that these miracles work based on faith. These miracles work based on faith. He forgave that man of his sins. He told him to get up and he was healed. He was healed. So there is power in your faith and your belief when somebody actually does have this gift of healing. Now that person doesn't necessarily, can't necessarily forgive you of your sins. You know, no, you're supposed to go to Jesus for that and they can ask on your behalf for, you know, the Lord to forgive you of your sins. But when somebody has that gift of healing, you have to believe that they really do, especially if they've shown fruits, they've done it before. And again, they're not asking for money or anything. They're just there, there to do what they have to do to heal you. All right, and sin can cause sickness. This is also why it's so important to be spiritually healthy, to seek the Lord, to continue to be prayerful and stay away from sin because what happens in the spiritual can manifest in the natural. Let's continue. So let's turn to Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. That's Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. Now, when he concluded all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. And a certain centurion's servant, who was dear to him, was sick and ready to die. So when he heard about Jesus, 
he sent elders of the Jews to him, pleading with him to come and heal his servants. And when they came to Jesus, they begged him earnestly, saying that the one for whom he should do this was deserving. For he loves our nation and has built us a synagogue. So let's continue on Luke chapter 7 verses 6 through 10. That's Luke chapter 7 verses 6 through 10. Then Jesus went with them and when he was already not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself for I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. Therefore, I did not even think myself worthy to come to you, but say the word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man placed under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him and turned around and said to the crowd that followed him, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And those who were sent, returning to the house, found the servant well who had been sick. So Jesus went to Capernaum and there was a centurion. A centurion is the commander of a hundred soldiers. And this centurion had a servant that was very, very sick, paralyzed and everything. This servant of his was so hardworking. He loved his nation. He built a synagogue and everything. And he heard, the centurion heard about Jesus and wanted Jesus to heal this servant because of how much of a great servant he was. And so he sent the elders to go and get Jesus. They go and get Jesus and Jesus is on his way to the centurion's home. But of course the centurion, because he's so humble, you know, and because he's such a believer of what Jesus can do, he understands that. He didn't even want to see Jesus. He didn't feel worthy is my point. He didn't feel worthy at all. That's what he was saying here. And so he sent some friends to tell Jesus he doesn't feel worthy, you know, and they, the, the friends talked about the centurion's occupation and what he does. And then they also talked about the servant and how the servant is just so obedient and listens, okay, and does his job and does his job well. And of course, Jesus was marveled at the faith of the centurion. He was so marveled at that, at that faith and he told the uh, friends of the centurion to go back to their home and that their servant will be healed. When they went back to the centurion's home, the servant was healed. Why? Because of that centurion's faith. This is also why it's important that your circle includes people who have a lot of faith because they can also help you get your prayers answered. They can lead you to healing. And it's also important for you to work hard Yes, and be a good servant. It's funny because Jesus was also a servant and here a servant needed help and that servant was now healed. So it's also important that even if you're doing work, the work that this servant was doing was secular. It would be considered secular today. But because he honored his boss, because he was such a hard worker and his boss respected him that much and had that much belief in Jesus, this guy was healed. So yes, it all, it's very important that you work as well. Working in the secular world is fine. This guy had not just the favor of God in his life, he had the favor of man. And because God saw that, because Jesus saw that and saw the faith of the centurion, his own boss, he was healed. So these are all important things to know and to understand as to how miracles work. And he was so marveled that they had all this uh, faith because he was going through a lot with the Pharisees as we saw. They kept attributing his miracles to Satan. They even said that he couldn't forgive sins. So of course, Jesus did what he had to do here. And that servant was healed. So this is very important for all of us to understand that we have to have that faith, that belief that we will be healed. 
we have to know that anything is possible with God. Everything is possible. And if we're working, we need to be good workers. We need to uh, be good stewards in front of people. We need to do that. We need to honor our bosses, just like this servant honored his own boss. And we have to also be humble no matter what stage we're at. This guy was, this guy was a commander. That, that, is high, that was high status back then. So we have to make sure that no matter what status that we're at, that we feel just as humble and as unworthy, so to speak, as this guy did. All right, let's continue. So let's continue on Luke chapter 8, verses 40 through 45. That's Luke chapter 8, verses 40 through 45. So it was when Jesus returned that the multitude welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. And behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue. And he fell down at Jesus' feet and begged him to come to his house, for he had an only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. But as he went, the multitudes thronged him. Now a woman having a flow of blood for 12 years, who had spent all her livelihood on physicians and could not be healed by any, came from behind and touched the border of his garment. And immediately her flow of blood stopped. And Jesus said, who touched me? When all denied it, Peter and those with him said, Master, the multitudes throng and press you, and you say, who touched me? Well, let's continue on Luke chapter 8, verses 46 through 50. That's Luke chapter 8, verses 46 through 50. But Jesus said, Somebody touched me, for I perceived power going out from me. Now when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared to him in the presence of all the people, the reason she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he said to her, daughter, be of good cheer and your faith has made you well. Go in peace. While he was still speaking, someone came from the ruler of the synagogue's house saying to him, your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him saying, do not be afraid, only believe, and she will be made well. And let's turn to Luke chapter eight, verses 51 through 56. That's Luke chapter eight, verses 51 through 56. When he came into the house, he permitted no one to go in except Peter, James, and John, and the father, and mother of the girl. Now all wept and mourned for her, but he said, do not weep. She is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him knowing that she was dead. But he put them all outside, took her by the hand and called saying, little girl, arise. Then her spirit returned and she arose immediately. And he commanded that she be given something to eat. And her parents were astonished but he charged them to tell no one what had happened. So Jesus returned from the Gerasenes, and of course there's a crowd of people waiting to see him because they really welcomed him in. They knew that he could heal, they knew that he could deliver, and they all wanted to see him. They all needed to be healed, they all needed to be delivered. And so he bumped into a man named Jairus, and that man was a ruler of a synagogue. And he dropped down to his feet, he really believed in Jesus, he had faith in him, and he wanted Jesus to come and see his daughter because his daughter was really, really sick and everything. And as Jesus was going through the crowd, of course, he got tugged and almost crushed, and there was a woman who had an issue with blood, okay? She had a, she had, she was bleeding for 12 years. And so she went and touched Jesus's hem, the hem of his garment, and all of a sudden the blood flow stopped. Now he didn't know who touched him and he was trying to figure out who did because after that person touched him, uh, the power, he felt a little bit of power come out. Not that he doesn't have power overflowing, but you know, the anointing, that's the way it works. Somebody touches you, you're gonna feel it, you're gonna know that somebody got healed just by touching your garment. 
and she did. Her blood flow stopped immediately. And this was something that was very hard for her because remember, in the book of Leviticus, it says when you're going through that, when you're having that flow, you have to be apart from people. That means that she had a hard time going to temple even. So this was something that's been bothering her. She was financially destitute as well. She went to every physician in the land and they couldn't help her. All right. And here she is healed as soon as she touches the hem of Jesus's garment. And that's a message for some of you. If somebody is anointed with that gift, they can pray over a hanky. They can pray over a handkerchief, anything. And you touch that garment, you're going to be healed. If that was the will of God for you to touch that garment and be healed of whatever you're going through. But again, you have to have faith just like this woman had faith. That's why she touched his garment. She knew who he was and she had faith that she was going to be healed because at this point she spent, she spent so much money and everything. And when he did figure out that it was her, you know, she proclaimed it. She said, I touched his garment and I was healed. And God told her to go in faith, you know, go in peace because of her faith. I mean, that she can go. And again, she testified right then and there so that others can believe. So this is why it happened in front of those people. A lot of these people already believed in Jesus and really wanted to, to touch him and everything. And this edified them to hear that this happened to her edified them. Okay. So now after that, he's on his way to Jairus's house. And as he's on his way to Jairus's house, they are telling Jairus to leave him alone. You know, leave Jesus alone. Your daughter is dead. He said, oh no, she's not dead. She's not dead at all and everything. And they were mocking him as he was saying this. Even when they went to the house, they were still mocking him. And when they went, when he went to their house, he didn't want anybody in the room with him and the daughter, except for Peter, James, and John, and also the mother and the father of the daughter. Why is that? Because already, you know, Peter, James, and John, these are people who trusted, these are people who you know they believe, okay? They saw his resurrection, right? And then also, when he came to the parents, the parents believed. He knew Jairus believed. And again, Jairus is a person of status. He ruled a synagogue, but yet he was so humbled before Jesus. So he kicked everybody out of the room. And not only that, he kicked the people who mocked him when he said, this woman is not dead. This woman is just sleeping. He kicked them out. Why do you think he did that? Because they did not believe. They would hamper his work. And so he told the girl to rise and everything. And she rose up, you know, and she was restored. Her life was restored. And the parents were just astonished. They were so surprised. But he told them not to tell anybody. Again, so this is the thing. You have to know when it's time to give a testimony, just like for the woman who had the problem with the blood, the 12 years of bleeding, that was a perfect time for her to give the testimony. She had the right unction and the right timing. But here, in this part of this, Jesus did not want them to say anything because he already knew that there was already people there who did not believe. And so Jesus had that foresight to not to have him not tell anybody. And remember, Jairus is a ruler of a synagogue. So he's one of the Jews, though, that actually believed in Jesus and believed in his power. So he wasn't like the Pharisees. But that's the thing. Jesus knew that he had to be careful. He knew that he had an appointed time when he was going to be sacrificed. And it wasn't supposed to be any kind of assassination by random people who are literally out to get him. And so he had to make sure that that mission is accomplished. I want to thank you guys so much for joining us. We will be talking about another spiritual gift next week. And then after that, we're going to be talking about miracles versus magic, uh, part four. Thank you and have a blessed week.